Okay. How many of you guys have heard of the movie Catch Me If You Can? You guys know this movie. All right, that's a good thing. Um, it was a blockbuster hit back in 2002. When I saw the date, I was like, no way. <laughs> that long ago, all right? Um, the movie opens with this scene of Frank William Abagnale Jr. struggling to breathe on the floor of a French prison. You guys remember this scene? And he's laying there on the floor, just, just like, man, what's going on? And it kind of starts to do a flashback. I love it when, it when it does that, yes? He starts hearing voices of like, how did I wind up here, okay? And it flashes him back to this nodule event um, that took place that got him where he landed in that French prison. Uh, anybody remember what was happening during that event? He starts hearing um, of his father uh, being inducted into a lifetime membership of the Rochester Rotary Club, all right, it's this big high stakes event. They're seated, he and his mother at the front table, right in the room, position of honor. And they're honoring this member, Frank Abagnale, right, who's going to be inducted into this Hall of Fame or whatever, this, this Rotary Club. And um, you hear this speech he starts to give, right? He thanks the club president, he thanks the mayor who's there, he thanks his wife, he thanks his son for being there. And then he gives this incredible speech. And by the way, this is Christopher Walken. And so. Just a tasty New York accent. Come on now. I should have my grandmother read this for us over there. <laughs> he says these words. Two little mice fell in a bucket of cream. You guys remember this? The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned. The second mouse wouldn't quit. He struggled so hard that eventually he turned that cream into butter and crawled out. Gentlemen, as of this moment, I am that second mouse. And the whole room erupts. Woo! Standing ovation, cheers, shrieking out. And you look at the scene cuts to Frank senior hugging Frank Jr. And Frank Jr. just beaming with pride in his dad's accomplishment, right? His dad was the picture of someone who's on top of the world. He was the self-made American man. He's the picture of all things that we hold successful. And little did Frank Jr. know that all of it was going to come crashing down around them in just moments. His father would lose his wife. He'd lose his best friend his business, and all the respect he had earned for himself. And that loss of everything would be the motivation Frank Jr. needed to start his life of fraud <laughs> and con artistry. Frank Jr. would go on to con millions of dollars in counterfeit checks to earn back his father's reputation, becoming in his own way a self-made man, the mouse that jumped out of the bucket. <laughs> Yeah? Actually, that story has its true roots in somebody who did this. And that event was the event he goes back to to say, this is why I started my life of crime. Because I needed to become a self-made man and get back what was taken from my father. Now, here's the thing. We're Christians. We don't celebrate crime. But that story is motivating, isn't it? <laughs> Just be honest, right? Um, we have an understanding of the world that says the one who makes it to the top are the ones who, with the best work ethic. Amen? Come on. The ones who have the most drive, the ones who have the greatest talent, or the ones who can fake it the most. Yes? And we celebrate that. We pride ourselves on our ability to achieve. How many of you guys really just don't care about achieving much in your life? Probably none of you, right? <laughs> Listen, those who make it to the good life, quote unquote, are the mice who don't stop swimming, the mice who don't give up, the ones who work harder than everybody else and who make it to the top. And we celebrate these stories, we glorify them, and we have been doing this for millennia. This is not an American thing. This is not a 21st century thing. This is a human thing. We celebrate the stories of ones who trudge through life, who keep going and make it to the top. And this is exactly, by the way, what was going on with the Jews of Paul's day in Romans. Abraham, the father of the Jews, was the supreme example of someone who was justified by what he did, by working hard, by keeping faithful, by staying active, by doing, doing, and doing. In fact, rabbinic um, literature is, rep is replete with examples of Abraham being the one who never stopped swimming. He just kept doing and, 
going and, and making it to the top. In fact, in the Mishnah's third section, it concludes that Genesis 26.5 teaches this, and it's wrong, by the way. And I quote, And we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was written. Hmm. For it's written in Scripture, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. According to the Mishnah in the Kiddushin 4.14, if you want to find it, Abraham did everything right. Uh, same is found, same sentiment in the book of Jubilees and in the prayer of Manasseh. You can go study those out for your enjoyment. Um, but the Jewish people believe that Abraham could boast in his abilities because he was one who was able to attain righteousness through his obedience. In fact, 1 Maccabees 2 says this, Remember the deeds of the fathers, the works, which they did in their generations and receive great honor and an everlasting name for you. Was not Abraham found faithful when tested? Found faithful. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Joseph, in the time of his distress, kept the commandment and became Lord of Egypt. Phinehas, our father, because he was deeply zealous, received the covenant of everlasting priesthood. Joshua, because he fulfilled the command, became a judge in Israel. Elijah, because of great zeal for the law, was taken up into heaven. My children, be courageous and grow strong in the law, for by it you will gain honor. According to Second Maccabees, all these men just kept swimming. They kept doing, and they received the reward. They got the good life. They made a way for themselves. All these men were justified by their works, so the argument goes, and it encourages you, so do like them. Work harder, and you'll make it. Sound familiar? Just work harder. Just do more. Or one of our favorite slogans, just do it. Church, we're going to be talking about works again today. Paul is going to be illustrating faith for us on the background of works, both of Abraham and David. He's going to contrast their lives to reveal the truth behind their justification. Were they justified by what they did or by something else? That's the question. And normally, I would have you pick up your Bible, and we would turn there, and we would start reading it, but we have 25 verses to get through today. We're going to crush through all of chapter 4. Come on. And so we're going to get them as we get them in our paragraphs as we move through that. But I would ask you to pray with me as we need the Lord to speak to us this morning, okay? Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for your word. Father, I pray this morning that we would hear the truth, God, that the technicality of some of this argument wouldn't keep us on the outside, but you'd bring us into the inside of understanding. Lord, that you would open our eyes to see you, to hear you, to cherish you, God, to love you, and to live in step with you. So God, I pray for that this morning. For my brothers and sisters, pray, God, over this room that our hearts will be receptive to your word. So church, just as, you, as we do, just invite the Lord to speak to you today. Just tell him you have need from him. Come in humbly before him. Just humble yourself before him. Tell him you don't sit above his word. You sit beneath it. You're willing to be taught. Church, would you pray for me? that God would keep me from misspeaking, that he would hold my tongue, that he would anoint my words to be his, that I wouldn't preach my own thoughts, but his word. Would you pray that over me this morning?
Lord Jesus, let us see the glory of the gospel today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen, church? Okay, here we go. So it's on that basis of believing, on that background, that you can justify yourself based on your works that Paul is going to be speaking into this, starting with the story of Abraham. So if you would, turn with your, in your Bibles to, um, to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, as I said earlier, we'll just be going through section by section. Um, as a little heads up, I'm going to explain these first three or four verses, and then I'm going to skip ahead because Paul kind of explains those, and then we'll jump back. So you guys good with me? We're going to start here, we're going to move forward, we're going to come back, then we're going to finish it out. Yes? I don't want to, I don't want to mess with you when we get there. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Okay? All right, we're good. Here we go. Chapter 4, verse 1, says this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? That's, by the way, according to his deeds. According to the flesh is his works, what he did. What was gained by him according to the flesh? Two, verse two. For if Abraham was justified by works, if he was, he has something to what? Right, but not before God. If Abraham could have saved himself at what he did, guess what? He could brag it up to all of y'all, couldn't he? But he can't before God because God made him and he's less than God's perfection. He'll never be able to boast before the Lord. Yes? Verse three. For who, what does, excuse me, for what does the scripture say? Paul's throwing back to Genesis here. Abraham, what's the word? Hmm. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul is quoting uh, Genesis 15, 6 here, which says this. And he, talking about Abraham, believed the Lord, Yahweh, and he, that's Yahweh, counted it to him, that's Abraham, as righteousness. Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Church, Paul's trying to make a point here, right out of the gate. Did any of you catch it? Not that you're going to want to yell out, <laughs> right? Um, here it is. Abraham was justified by faith before he did any of the works he is famous for. If you know where Paul is quoting and you know the story of Genesis moving from one to the next in chronology, what's happening is that uh, Paul is arguing Abraham, according to God's word in Genesis, was justified by faith before he ever did anything for God. Now, that is smacking right in the face of Jewish theology. What we just read in the Mishnah, in Maccabees, okay, from the book of Jubilees and from the prayer of Manasseh, all those writings are predating this and are articulating that he was saved by what he did. Paul just said he was saved by what he believed. Now, I want to I show you this because Paul's going to make it very clear. Like, well, I don't know, is that the chronology he's working with? What's he doing here? I want to show you exactly where he goes. So this is why we're going to skip forward to verse 17, okay? We will come back and get the rest, I promise, all right? But we're going to go to 17 now, and it says this. Paul's unpacking what had taken place in Genesis 14 and 15 to understand where this is located, okay? As it is written, again, he's quoting scripture, I have made you the father of many nations. Paul goes on to expound. In the presence of the God in whom he, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That verse. Hmm. Verse 18, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Okay, so what's going on here, guys? In Genesis 14, Abraham had just fended off four kings in an epic battle where he triumphed over them, rescuing his nephew Lot. Good job, all right, good job. Biblical trivia, here we go. Um, he's pumped about his victory and he has a dream that night and he's thinking about, man, all the success he has. He's got 365 warriors who fight with him in this battle. It's going great. All things are working well, right? He's got all of this wealth. When Abraham comes to town, by the way, it's like a little nation moving in already, yeah? An entourage of people that's coming with him. He's super rich. Yay, yay, yay. All these things, great victory. And then he thinks this, I've got nobody to give that to. got no son. 
There's no heir for who this is going to get. And he, and he prays. He goes, God, I've got no heir to give this to. In fact, I've got some distant, like, nephew or something to give this to. Right? No son of my own is what's happening here. And God, in that dream, promises to give him a son, an offspring, and to make him into a nation. That's God's promise there. He would have so many offspring, it would be like trying to number the stars, God says. And at that point, on that promise, Scripture tells us Abraham believed God. I'm going to give you a son, Abraham. And Abraham says, I believe. Paul continues, verse 19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. The word of God. <laughs> Since he was about 100 years old. Come on now, there's an obstacle, yeah? Dear God, let me not be a hundred and still having kids. <laughs> Preach. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. How old was Sarah? Any women in here close to 90? <laughs> not willing to admit it? <laughs> Young 80s, looking great. That's old, right? Do you know the Guinness Book of World Records says that the oldest woman to have a baby is how old? You guys know? 69. How many are plus or minus 69? Right in the neck of the wood, ladies. Come on now. <laughs> okay. Plus or minus. We don't know, all right? You're looking great. How about having a baby? You get the point. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Verse 21, fully convinced, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Church, Abraham really did believe God. If you read his story, it's just so funny to read his story because if you read his story, it's, he's got a whole bunch of missteps and sin and brokenness and things that the Jewish community are just totally disregarding. <laughs> Brush it right under the rug, right? Not Father Abraham, you know. He messed up. In fact, guys, he traded his wife out, not once, but twice, to save his own skin. Uh, any of you men do that in here, we're going to come have a visit and we're going to lay hands on you, but not in prayer. <laughs> and right here, this is where Abraham was called righteous, not because of anything he did, but because of what he believed. Guys, he trusted that God would do what God said he was going to do, even though everything looked like it was impossible. Come on. Nobody expects their 90-year-old barren wife to give birth to a child. Nobody expects to become a dad at 100. Let me ask you, church, are you fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised? I want you to think that one through. I want you to write that one down. Am I fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised? That's the kind of faith of Abraham right there. When God says, I will wash your sins white as snow, guess what? He can and he will. Do you believe? Do you believe? Church, again, what's Paul's point he's trying to prove here? I said it earlier. Abraham was justified by faith before he did any of the works he is famous for. In fact, he goes right from believing the promise to really screwing up the promise. The whole Hagar Ishmael thing, you know, we'll just leave that one under the rug as well. That happens right next, yes? He believes. He believes. Verse 4 
skipping back, okay? You there? Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. We talked about this a few weeks ago. If you, how many of you all have jobs in here? Kind of, ish. Yeah. When you work, you get a paycheck, mostly, right? <laughs> You're getting what's due you, yes? They're not giving you a favor. It's not a gift. It's not a blessing. You're getting what you earned. That's, that's wages, yes? Um, but verse 5, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Interesting. Church, we already talked about last week, wages being something you earn. Justification is something you cannot earn. It is a gift that is given to you. You can't earn salvation by what you do, period. Amen? You earn death, Paul will get into. The wages of your life, the right payment, is death. But verse 5 said that those who are justified are justified by faith, not by their works, not by what they do. Do any of you remember what justification is from last week? We're winning so hard right now. <laughs> justification, you knew I was going to remind you anyway, right? It's not going to leave it. Is the legal declaration that you are righteous, all right? Justification is God's declaration in the courtroom of God that you are, in fact, righteous. Now, some people will say justification is the declaration that you are innocent. It's way more than that. Church, it's not just that you're innocent of the crimes you committed. It's that you're, in fact, righteous. Now, we're going to just do a little excursus here down justification lane. You guys with me? I need you to get this. So here's the question I have for you. How can God, who is just, declare the guilty innocent, let alone righteous? He doesn't think they can. (laughs) How can God do that? Right? If God is just, how can he say this person is righteous when in fact they're not? Have you ever thought about that before? I like lay awake at night thinking about these things. I don't know about you guys. This is how my mind works. Um, Think about it. For God to look at the evidence of your life, when God looks at the evidence of your life, what's he going to see? Guilty, right? Sin. You failed to measure up to his standard, yes? Church, he's going to look at the evidence and it's going to be overwhelmingly guilty. Not just like, "Mm, I don't know, flip it, this one, you know what I mean? Like overwhelmingly guilty. And then he's going to call you innocent. If he did that, that would be injustice, wouldn't it? Everybody shake your head, yes. If a judge does that, when a guilty man goes free, is that justice? No, this is simple, isn't it? When, when someone who commits a crime gets away with it and walks and doesn't pay for that crime, is that justice? No, it's not. And yet we say that God is just. He is just. So how does that work? No one would contend that it was fair or righteous on God's part to clear the guilty, let alone then say they're righteous. This means that in order for you to be declared righteous, you must actually be righteous. So let me ask you, are you righteous? Do you see the problem here? Let's read that verse again. For those of you who just like freaked out, just stay with me, okay? (laughs) We're getting somewhere. And to the one who does not work, but believes, underline that word, but believes in him who justifies the the who? What? His faith is counted as righteousness. Church, in order for God to justify the guilty, they must first be righteous. So look what God does. 
And I hope this will just blow your mind today. That word counted in verse 5, that their faith is counted as righteousness in this verse is the Greek word logisomai, logisomai. This word can be translated as counted, reckoned, considered, imputed, etc. Paul uses the word 11 times in this chapter. And it has the meaning simply of this church, crediting to one's account. Crediting to one's account. Look at some I counted. How many of you guys are familiar with crediting something to an account? How many of you guys operate in a world that uses money? <laughs> Great. Okay. We're going to do some math here real quick. Um, <clears throat> Guys, what Paul is saying here is that for God to count you as righteous, he must first give you a righteousness that is alien from yourself. In order for God to count you as righteous, you must actually have some righteousness. And the problem is, are you righteous? No, right? So what about God's justice? How do we deal with that? You must actually be righteous or God is lying. That creates a whole lot of other problems, doesn't it? So what does God do? He credits or imputes righteousness to you so that you are actually made righteous. He credits righteousness to you. He imputes righteousness to you. Think of it like this. Imagine this wild, wacky scenario where you had to make a deposit into your bank account. Anybody ever done this before? I'm just making a whole bunch of withdrawals lately, right? (laughs) Christmas time. Anyway, just imagine that you had $1,000 you were given that you've got to put into your account. You've done this before? Okay. Um, What you just did was impute $1,000 to your account. You with me? Now, after the requisite number of days to process, right, you go to the account and you want to withdraw $900 from your account. Let's just say you had nothing, you put 1,000 in, you withdraw 900, how much do you have left? Welcome to first grade, here we go. (laughs) So you go to the bank and you try to withdraw $900 from your account. And the banker says to you, it's not there. What would you say? (laughs) Check again. Why? Because I just took some paper with some numbers on it that said 1,000 and I put it in your system and your system on my little app says that I have 1,000 in there, yes? It says it's there. You would say, what do you mean it's not there? I just imputed $1,000 to my bank account. Church, if there wasn't actually money in your account, then what good is it? You can, you can write on your own statement and say you got $125,000 in there. If there's not $125,000 in there, how are you going to buy anything? Are you with me? You can say it's there, but just saying it's there doesn't actually make it there, does it? What's your expectation of the banker? That when I take that check and I put it in my account, when I impute that to my account, it's actually, and I can use it, yes? Church, how does this work when it comes to justification? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me read that one more time. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who did not sin. So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Church, these are not just words divorced from reality. These aren't just numbers on a page. God actually did this. Jesus became sin. That's why he died. Do you get that? Jesus became, our sin was taken off of those who believe and was put on Jesus Christ and God killed him because of it. 
actual sin. Jesus became your sin and he became my sin so that the wrath of God could be put on Jesus, actually paying the price. Come on now. And we get that and we think of that and we're like, wow, the cross is amazing, right? Praise God. But do you understand what actually happens next? Whew, listen. God took the righteousness of Jesus and put it on you and he put it on me. Jesus didn't just become sin. Jesus' his righteousness was transferred from his account to yours. Jesus became sin, so we become righteous. And all of that is through faith. Doesn't that just blow your mind? This is why the New Testament stops calling you a sinner at conversion and says you're a saint. A saint. Because in Christ, you have become the righteousness of God, church. Let that blow your mind today. And you think that's not fair. You are 100% correct. <laughs> The righteousness of Christ is given to you by faith, not by anything you have done. And it is real righteousness, not legal fiction. God is not just saying you are righteous. He made a way for you to be. In Christ, you have been made righteous through faith. In Christ, you have been made righteous through faith. There is righteousness in your account, y'all, because of Jesus Christ. Come on. That's unbelievable. I want you to think of it like this. And this is just so horrifyingly beautiful, but also like devastating because of the reality of it. Um, let's just say in some weird circumstance, you went to Walmart. <laughs> Every illustration I do begins with something with Walmart. And uh, if you work at Walmart, we love you, okay? <laughs> but we really don't like your store. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful. Um, but you go to Walmart, and any, anytime you just hit the parking lot, and you instantly feel stressed, right? And then you're like, you're like worn out with somebody with a shopping cart down the aisle, you know what I mean? And then the self-checkout's like backed up to like the children's food. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and so it has an opportunity for you to become like either more sanctified or a whole lot more sinful, right? <laughs> There's really like one of two options for you or for me, be honest. And, and let's just imagine that, you know, you got in your car and you're in this like little ragey state. Anybody, no, no one can relate to this. Okay, good. Um, and you take off through the parking lot and you run somebody down who is blocking you because you just got to get home, bump, bump, and you're like, bah! get out of there. Now, was it deliberate? Mm. <laughs> tomato, tomato, you know, I mean, but at any rate, you know, I, so I used to listen to like true crime podcasts and um, I don't anymore because I just the world's too dark enough as it is. We don't need that. But every, every other episode of a true crime podcast winds up using Walmart surveillance footage to solve a crime. I'm not kidding. <laughs> they go back to it time and time again. It's always Walmart. It's always their surveillance and they always have it, right? It's like amazing. And so um, imagine the Walmart surveillance footage happened to get you, Yeah. They see you, run this person down, you know, with your car, and then speed off and flee, yes? They got you on footage, the, the investigation, you know, they broke you down, the whole thing. You're in the room, you finally confess. It's like, yeah, I did it, okay? And you're guilty. You with me? Such a great scenario, isn't it? It's just awesome. 
Okay. Oh, this isn't even my notes. I'm just rolling here. So we're just going to see where this goes. Um, you're guilty. You with me? Judge looks at all the evidence. What happens? Did I mean to? Did I not? Doesn't matter. You're guilty. Yeah? At least vehicular manslaughter. Right? Okay. What's the right thing for the judge to do? Sentence. Fair? Unequivocal evidence, you're done. This is what imputation of righteousness is like. Jesus takes your sentence. The judge doesn't say that you're innocent. In fact, it's all the evidence of your life proved that you're guilty. But that verdict, that punishment, that sentence has been placed on another. And then here's where imputation comes from, comes in. Jesus, who, by the way, is the, the one by whom we are made, is the maker of humanity. Come on now. He's the giver of life. He says, I've come so that you would have life. God says, it's not that we saw you ran this person over and fled. We now look at you through Jesus' finished work, through him actually authoring life. You are credited not with taking life, but with giving it. The righteousness of Christ has been given to you. Come on now. That's an alien righteousness that doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. That's what happens with justification, church. And it's amazing. That concludes our excursus on justification. <laughs> now, you think that's great news for Abraham, right? He became righteous. Um, he did so many great things. Maybe God made him righteous because God knew he was going to be obedient. He was going to offer his son. He was going to, you know, blah, 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 right? Maybe his works is what inclined God to make him righteous, and so that was great. But what about me? Up to date, my life hasn't been that great kind of mess some things up. I wouldn't say I'm even as close to Abraham with his righteousness. Yeah? What about for people like that? What about for the good people? They get it. We get that. What about for the bad people, though? How does that work for them? Paul anticipates this thinking, so he goes on to tell us about David. Read this, verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing, what's the blessing? Imputation of righteousness, justification. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not Count his sin. And if you're wondering in the Septuagint, that is logizomai, the same word. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul is quoting from Psalm 32, 1 through 2 here. In Psalm 32, David is praising God for his forgiveness over his sin with Bathsheba. And if you remember that sin, when David sinned with her, he broke at least three of God's commands explicitly. He coveted, he committed adultery, and he murdered. Three out of ten, that's pretty great. And all of this sin was premeditated. This isn't vehicular manslaughter second degree, this is first degree. In the Old Testament system, there was no sacrifice, no way of atoning for premeditated sin. Do you realize that? It's called sin of a high hand if you read through the first five books. And yet, God forgave. Church, when Paul quotes this psalm, there is something significant going on for the Jewish readers. See, when they would hear a part of a psalm quoted, they would think of the whole context of the psalm. He's not just quoting these verses out of it. He's quoting the meaning of the psalm, yes? It's how they studied scripture, okay? What does this whole have to say? So we need to ask this question, how were David's sins not counted against him? How? 
We find the answer in verse 10 of Psalm 32. David writes this. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Church, David's sins were not counted against him because he trusted the Lord for forgiveness. There was no possible work that could have been done to cover David's sin. Nothing he could do to atone. And yet he was forgiven simply because he confessed and threw himself on the mercy of God. He believed the promise of God, the promise that says, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. David believed that when God said that about himself, that he meant it. He trusted in the heart of God to forgive, that God inclines himself to forgive the guilty. Come on. Church, he threw himself on the mercy of God and that trust was credited to him as righteousness while his sin was not held against him. Come on, that's the gospel. Church, despite his great deeds... Abraham was justified by faith, not works. And church, despite his great sin, David was justified by faith, not works. Come on now. Praise the Lord. Now, if you're thinking right, You're going, this is great news for the Jews. They brought out two of their superstars, (laughs) Abraham and King David, right? They're justified by faith. That's great. What about the rest of us? What about the Gentiles? Remember, Paul's writing to Jews and Gentiles in Rome. Are they justified the same way? Do they receive the same kind of blessing? Or is it different? Let's look. Verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? That's little code word for the Jewish, yes? Or also for the uncircumcised, non-Jews, the rest of us. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. True? So the argument is he making, yes? How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He had received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Come on now, what was Paul's answer? Abraham was justified before he was a Jew so all could be justified regardless of their Jewishness. Come on now. In fact, it wasn't Abraham's circumcision that saved him, it was his faith. If you add up the amount of time Abraham went from receiving the promise to be a nation and the covenant sign of circumcision, you know how much time goes between those two things? You're going to be a nation. That nation's going to be circumcised. You know how long it goes to being circumcised? 14 years. In fact, some of the uh, Jewish literature says it's 29 years. So somewhere between 14 and 29 years, he's saved by faith before he ever does the covenant sign. Meaning, Abraham was a Gentile who was justified by faith before ever becoming a Jew. Abraham was declared righteous as a Gentile, signifying that the Gentiles can be declared righteous apart from Judaism. This would have blown your mind. Because what does it mean 
Salvation is for all. <laughs> all. Everyone is justified the same way by grace through faith in Christ. And listen to these words apart from the law. Look how Paul continues, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Church, if circumcision had nothing to do with Abraham's justification, then the law had even less to do with it. The law came 430 years after Abraham was made heir to God's promise through faith. 430 years. Therefore, the promise to Abraham was not conditional upon the law in the least. What's Paul saying? Righteousness has always come by faith to those who have faith, not by the law. It was the same in the Old Testament as it is today. Come on now. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Church, this would have just leveled you as a first century Jew. <laughs> But it's 100% true. Nobody was saved both by the law sprinkled with faith. It has always been by faith alone. Church, the law served to show transgression. Transgression is not sin in the fullest sense. Transgression is law-breaking. It's transgressing the law. The law enhances our sense of inability to keep the law. It condemns us and reveals us to be under the wrath of God. But faith brings assurance of salvation in Jesus. And justification by faith preceded Judaism. So Paul sums up this. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promises may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Church, salvation comes by grace through faith. This is how it has always been and how it will be till Christ comes again. So what do we do with this truth? We're going to conclude here with this. Verse 23. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Come on, church. Church, Abraham's story is not in the Bible because it's cute and inspiring. It's not here for us to think how great for Abraham. It's not here for us to think that's amazing for him. Church, his story is meant to teach us that God is doing the same thing for us. God is counting the faith of all who believe in the Lord Jesus as righteousness on our behalf. That's all he's counting. <laughs> what that promise says again, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord. Church, notice the absolute nature of that statement. Real righteousness will be imputed to the account of those who really believe in Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? Come on. Church, it is the faith of those who believe that justifies them with God, not their works. And here's the gospel. Some of you came here because you need this truth today. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses says church Christ Jesus was delivered over to the wrath of God because of our sin what we just read was he became sin this is why 
the cross. This is why his death, he died to pay the real price of our real sin. You see that? Church, if our sin had merely killed Jesus, if he had not risen from the dead, then we would be in no better of a position. See, if Christ had only died, then we would only be able to die with him. Do you get that? See, if, if he had only died, then his righteousness wouldn't have been given over to us. It would have died with him. But what does it say God did? It says that God raised him from the dead. This is what he says. He was raised for our justification. Come on now. Jesus didn't stay in that grave. Hallelujah. See, God accepted his death as the fulfillment, the complete price for our sin. Christ's death paid the price for our sin in the full church. And we know that and we can believe that because God raised him from the dead. It's accepted. And he was raised for our justification. Church, when Christ walked out of that tomb, we walked free. His real righteousness is imputed to us, making us actually righteous before God Almighty. I asked you earlier, are you righteous? And the answer is by faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, I am. And all of this is by his grace through faith in Jesus. This is our justification. Church, here's the reality. Two mice didn't fall into a bucket of cream. They jumped. One gave up and drowned in the bottom. The other kept swimming and swimming. But he couldn't swim fast enough. He couldn't swim long enough. He couldn't jump high enough to save himself. So he drowned too. Two mice sank in that bucket of cream and were lying dead on the bottom. But then a hand reached in and plucked one out. Raised it back to life and set it free. That's the gospel. And that can be you today, if you believe. Church, by faith, Christ can reach into your bucket of shame, of sin, of brokenness, of death, and he can pull you out from the bottom. You can't do it. Maybe you've been trying for a long time. You've been trying to live the good life. You've been trying to go, do good things, and you know that you haven't been able to measure up, and you've been trying and trying and failing, and you're becoming tired, and the truth is you need a savior. You need the one who can reach in and lift you from death to life. The one who can take your death, your drowning, and take it on himself and then raise to life so you can be raised to life with him. Church, listen to me. The truth is you need a savior and it's from his death that you can have life. Come on now. And all it is is this. Trust him. Trust him. That's it. Trust in his forgiveness like David did. You might have really screwed up your life. David really screwed up his life. And yet he trusted in the forgiveness of Jesus and God counted it to him as righteousness. Or maybe you need to trust in his promise like Abraham. Unwavering trust that because God said he will save, that he will actually do it. Believe the promise of God to raise you to life by the Son through his work, and you will be saved. That's the gospel. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you raise the dead in this room today? God, I'm praying for salvation.
God, we believe with all of our heart that the people who have faith in you, in your finished work, in your cross, Jesus, that you died in their place and you were raised to life, that that was a testimony of what you are going to do for us. And we believe that by faith, we are declared not innocent, but righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray over the room this morning that men and women and children who heard this message today, who were given ears by the Spirit of God to hear this truth, and in their heart right now, they're going, I know that's true. I, don't, I might not understand all of the things, but I understand one thing, and that's this, that God took my sin and he placed it on his son and he killed it on that cross. And then that same God raised that son to life so that his righteousness we put in my bank account. And I believe, I believe that you will forgive my sins because you paid for it at the cross. And I believe in the promise of eternal life because of what you did on that cross. I believe and I trust. Lord God, I'm praying for belief this morning in Jesus' name. If that's you today, I, I, want, I don't normally do this, but I just feel compelled by the Lord so we can pray for you as a, as a body. This is not a moment of shame or of guilt or of anything but rejoicing when a sinner says, listen, I'm stepping forward in belief and becoming a saint. That's a powerful moment. And so this morning, I just invite you, if that's you today, just raise a hand and look at me today. You're moving from unbelief to belief today. Yeah, I see you, brother. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. Come on. Good job. I see you, sister. Good job. Praise the Lord. People moving from death to life right now. Listen to me. Listen to what just happened to you. God just looked at your life and he said, I see your sin. I see your brokenness. And I paid for it through my son, Jesus. And he declared in this moment right now, in this moment, you are righteous. <laughs> Come on. Anybody else today, God is saving you today. You say, today's my day. Come on, today's the day. I'm moving from, yes, yes. Come on, brother. Come on. Come on. It's good. Everybody else says, today is the day. I'm moving from non-belief to belief. Come on. Yes, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, Jesus. Woo. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Your sin is taken away. Your guilt is atoned for. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood, come on, of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We thank you for salvation. God, we praise you. And we thank you that right now in heaven, there is dancing, there is rejoicing, there's a party going on because of four people who gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Come on, church. Let's stand, church. Let's welcome them in. Come on now. Let's stand up, stand up. We welcome you. Listen. <laughs> we are all here saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on now. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Come on now. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for saving. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. We bless you. And we praise you, Jesus. <laughs> that you delight to save. <laughs> We trust you. God, we're overwhelmed by your goodness. I praise you.
In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Let's praise God. Come on now. All right.